Okay, hi, I am Brian Cardell. I am a developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Egalia. And uh, today we have a guest. Do you want to introduce yourself? Um, sure. Hi to both of you. It's great to be here with you. Uh, my name is Robin Burgeon. I work on standards at, and governance at uh, Protocol Labs, and I also uh, sit on the board of directors of W3C. Yeah, great. And uh, the reason that we uh, asked Robin to come on today is um, we've been doing this series, I think we're up to 12 or 13 episodes already that started in 2020. Uh, and we began talking about web engine diversity and web ecosystem health. There's like a whole series of chats that we've done. And uh, that same year in 2020 that we started that, I also was supposed to give a talk at Web Directions that was originally called Web Browsers and Inconvenient Truth <laughs> Ecosystem in Crisis. And I never wound up giving it. Um, but since then, I've converted some of those into articles. I noticed that Robin especially like writes about some very similar things. And uh, he and Maria Farrell recently wrote an excellent piece called We Need to Rewild the Internet. Could you think that you could sort of break it down for us, Robin? Like, would it explain the metaphor at least? Sure. I mean, I, <laughs> the first thing I would say is that it, it, rewilding the internet is not meant to be a metaphor. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the core idea really is that when you're dealing with a highly complex environment such as the web, um, where, you know, nowadays we're talking about 5 billion users, you know, thousands of companies and, and, and entities interacting with one another, millions of websites. When you're dealing with a really complex environment, the rules that uh, prevail in an ecosystem, in a natural ecosystem, are very similar to the rules that apply to, 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 to that kind of environment. And so when we look towards rewilding as an ecological practice, um, it really is to find tools um, to help us um, create a, 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 you know, bring back essentially a healthier and livelier um, web. And so it, it's not, it, it's not a nostalgic uh, approach. It really is a, hey, you know, given that this is a really complex environment, what kind of approach would make it sustainable, would make it healthy, would make it pleasant to be in? Um, and so in order to, to do that, we learn from um, conservation biologists and this entire uh, universe of, of rewilding where people have very specific approaches that differ from what we're seeing in general from either governments or, or corporations. And I mean, rewilding in in the ecological sense, since you brought it up, like what, how, how does one rewild ecologically? The thinking around uh, ecological rewilding is, is to depart from uh, previous approaches to, to conservation biology that um, are characterized by, by what is generally called uh, the pathology of command and control. Uh, what initially happened when people started to care about ecology is that a number of projects um, started by looking at what they thought were pristine environments and decided that, you know, basically everything had to be preserved um, to be as similar to what they thought of as, as pristine environments. Re the rewilding approach is much more about realizing that in an ecosystem, every um, every species has basically a functional role and that functional role is in part to control other, uh, you know, other participants in, in the ecosystem. And basically this mutual collective form of control creates a form of balance that is dynamic and that, that uh, yields greater complexity. And so what rewilders have generally done is they look for mechanisms that sort of in part let you know nature run its course because you you can't control the complexity but also where needed uh, seek very specific functional um, interventions so one of the one of the famous cases especially here here, here in the US it was the reintroduction of, of wolves in in several habitats notably uh, the, the Yellowstone area um, 
And you know, when when wolves were were reintroduced, they started preying on deer, which means that um, deer ate less of certain types of plants uh, that had been uh, that 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 had been seriously damaged. And because of that, all kinds of erosion processes were halted. Um, and so, just this single re reintroduction of one. Uh, one species that served a function that had disappeared uh, was, was successful in, in bringing back balance, but also li li liveliness to, to the ecosystem. And there are plenty of other examples, not all, all of them successful, but really the idea is to approach this class of complex problems, not with a very controlling uh, mindset, but not either with a completely laissez-faire um, mindset. The idea is how do you find something that is dynamically uh, balanced so that no species has too much power, no participant has too much power, and and by by bringing about this this um, this equality, you get something that is much more lively. Yeah, that's interesting, especially since it, it seems to fly in the face of a lot of how our industry operates <laughs> in a way. In a lot of places, there's very, a lot set on how do we measure the outcomes? Like what are the OKRs or whatever the latest term is, right? And this is more of a, well, we have a general goal and we're going to try to get there through sort of a chaotic method. Am I mischaracterizing that? I don't think you're, you're mischaracterizing it. I think I think maybe chaotic I mean, chaotic is certainly one way to, to, to look at it because nothing is in control and you, therefore you don't want a completely ordered regime. But it's also not complete chaos in the sense that in a, in a, you know, in a functioning healthy environment, you also get a lot of structure. You get a lot of, uh, of order at all kinds of scales. It's just not a top down, single centered, um, ordering and, 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 and control system. And so one way to think of it is, Instead of having, you know, one set of OKRs, one set of KPIs for the entire environment, you let a diversity of different actors have their own OKRs, have their own KPIs that, that are distinct from one another and then enter into, into a form of tussle so that they, they get, you know, they, they make things work as, as best they can for themselves, but they don't impose excessively on others. Um, and, and, you know, one great example of how having a single set of OKRs for the entirety of the web uh, can go wrong um, is that there's been a, there was a very good uh, um, article in The Verge about how uh, Google's SEO rules have basically uh, shaped the entirety of the web uh, or, or, you know, very near the entirety of the web. And, and there's a good reason for that. If you're not on Google today, given Google's dominance, um, essentially you're invisible. It's like, it's, it's, it's essentially the same and perhaps even worse than not being registered with DNS. These are basically the two primary information uh, seeking systems on, um, uh, on the web. And so because everyone's, uh, abiding by the same OKRs, uh, it, the entire web now looks like it was designed, uh, to match the KPIs of Google middle management, which is not what it was supposed to be. And so instead of having a, a completely chaotic system, um, where, you know, nothing is, 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 is findable, nothing is structured, we, we, we can sort of imagine a richer set of structures where a diversity of, uh, a great diversity of systems get to shape and order, you know, corners, environments, overlapping parts of the web instead of having either just one or a complete you know, complete mess. There's so a thing I want, would like to actually just read from this article. It says, our online spaces are not ecosystems, though tech firms love that word. They're plantations, highly concentrated and controlled environments, closer akin to the industrial farming of cattle feedlot or battery chicken farms that madden the creatures trapped within. It's a good piece. I, I really enjoyed it. Glad you like it. <laughs> I guess there's there's a big question here that's also like, so what and how did it get this way and like what can we do about it you know um so like what what is it that makes it this way and keeps it this way you know um you have some other people that you also have written that are a little bit more specific and i i also like this quote from you're gonna need a bigger browser it says we should move away from the assumptions that browsers are free and therefore cannot make money it's a lie there's money to fund a much wet, better web 
and much more powerful user agents that support user agency. That money is currently locked up because defaults have been set and literally nothing else matters. Together, the three of us actually led a session at um, W3C breakout session this year about how we fund the web. And I, I think that's very related. But yeah, I don't, I don't know if uh, you would like to present any of the things that we talked about or like. Uh, happy to. I mean, that, I think that the, the money question is, is really central. The reason we're in this uh, bad situation today is we have an interlocking set of, of constraints that reinforce one another and prevent money from flowing to places where it could help bring about change. And so basically, you know, people get an operating system uh, on their mobile devices. It's one of two operating systems. That operating system is going to have a default um, browser and possibly a default search app. And both of those default browsers and any default search app will point back to the same default search engine. In turn, in turn, that default search engine makes money from being the default, which allows it to buy its position as the default search engine in all browsers, in all operating systems. And so because defaults and because uh, switching friction are so effective, um, this creates a system in which basically one company can own any everything and keep financing everything and finances every single browser and, 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 and pays for its continued dominance. And there's no way to break into that. You could make the best search engine ever. Um, and you would never, you would never have a single chance of entering, um, that market. And if you make a browser, it is basically practically your only, uh, possible source of revenue. There's a few exceptions. There's edge. Um, but it uses the same model uh, from Microsoft, and, and that's it. The amount of money that we're talking about is huge. We're talking, uh, you know, it, Google pays um, over, over $35 billion a year to other companies just to be the default. That's not counting uh, how, much that, how much money um, they would value being the default in Chrome at as well, or in Android. Um, as well. So we're talking tens of billions of dollars that are taken from the web because search is a concentration of the value of the web. It is, it is, you know, where all the content comes is distilled into the single place. Um, and without that content, the search would be, would be without value whatsoever. And so it takes mo um, money from the web and uses that to pay for market dominance. And that money for the most part does not go back into supporting the web. Most of the money that Google makes on the web goes into supporting its other activities in completely unrelated fields. The $20 billion that Apple gets from that system um, uh, of default search engine and, and search engine royalties um, every year, those $20 billion do not are not reinvested by Apple into supporting the web. So all this money is being taken from the web, from value created by the web and invested in non-web things and invested basically in locking down market dominance. Well, and shareholder profit. And shareholder profit. Well, yeah, of course. Um, but, but I'm not even sure they give that much back in, 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 in profit. A lot of it is, is, you know, being reinvested in, 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 you know, dominating the next slice of industry, uh, the next slice of the computing, uh, co 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 computing sphere. And so, you know, as people who would like a healthy web, our only chance of changing this is to change the system. There's no way that we can outcompete you know, people who can put tens of billions of dollars into dominating a space. The only way we can, you know, re we can shift that is by shifting uh, this funding model. And essentially, the strength of that of that of that of that model is also what makes intervention possible. The strength of that model is that it's entirely consolidated around like a very narrow intervention point, which is search royalties. And so, if we can take control over search royalties and you know, basically uh, assert the right of the web to that money via uh, a number of policy interventions, um, then we can gain access to that money and use it to fund actual web infrastructure, which, you know, 
would would be would be a huge change. I'll get off the soapbox for for, for a minute, and 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 I'd love to hear what what you two have to say about that as well. So I, you say policy intervention, you really mean like governmental policy intervention? Yes. I mean, it, it, it's it's the most likely path. Um, I think for two reasons. One, I doubt that this will be done voluntarily in industry and that we can find the pressure points to make it happen otherwise. The other reason for which I think it's likely is because it's actually a relatively simple privacy intervention to make that, uh, to make that possible. You basically need to tie uh, the ability to set a default search engine or to set, set search royalties with participation, um, into this taxation system. And I think there are ways of making that attractive to a sufficiently um, impactful, um, uh, you know, re regulatory jurisdiction that we can actually make it happen. Yeah. So like, um, just, you know, this isn't uh, like a concrete, like this is the, this must be the way, but <laughs> Like if you, if you imagine where, when you set up your operating system, it let you choose the defaults, like Microsoft was sort of forced to in courts with regard to the browser, right? Way back. Um, one of the things that you could correct in that kind of model would be that you could enforce that in, in order to be eligible to be chosen as default, you must participate in this, you, you must pay back. So if you're chosen, however you make your money, it has to be paid back in some kind of like, let's call it a levy or tax or whatever that would help fund things. Right. So it, it would allow things to get traction in the first place. So as I said, we, there was a, like a, a bit of a historical accident where like Mozilla was the first real like open source thing in the modern open source sense, trying to do a browser and they got some early funding but like, how was that going to work exactly wasn't clear. They still, because of the inertia of being previously Netscape and this interest in this new idea of open source, they still had like 3% of the market already, like before they ever launched just their, their beta had like 3% of the market. Um, and that 3% was worth eyeballs to Google, who was also trying to get search, you know, like they were trying to launch search. So when they, when they struck that deal, that was like a moment in history that's really hard to recreate. Like Brave is, it's not maybe in the top echelon, but it's like pretty well known. It has tens of millions of users monthly and it like, it doesn't even show up on the graphs because that's how big the web is, you know? So if you wanted to break in, uh, you need a way to fight the defaults problem and you know that that would be one way to battle the defaults problem where you could amass enough market share to matter enough to get a deal and then that deal would have to play back into this levy system i i think we're all struggling because because you know we we all, all of us grew up in a world with a very simplified idea of how you know, things like this get organized, right? These, these, you have companies, they exist in a country, that country is governed by a state, all the states have, have like, you know, a very nested hierarchical structure that is pretty simple and legible. And then internationally, well, those companies might have uh, some difficulties because they need to comply with multiple laws, but there's, there's no real, you know, transnational thing except for the UN, but that's kind of vague and, and they deal with things like human rights that seem pretty far away from, from JavaScript to, to, to most people. Um, but, what we actually need to think about is the fact that, you know, the web, the digital sphere in general has created this entire new space. That space is completely transnational. It's not, you know, it, it really doesn't align with territorial boundaries and it is becoming the infrastructure, not just for a few, you know, games and, and unimportant things, but it's the infrastructure of all infrastructure. It's the infrastructure of everything. And therefore, you know, we need to ramp up our thinking to match the complexity of the task. I mean, you mentioned the difficulty in, in getting to 1% uh, on, on any kind of diagram. Yeah, 1% of 5 billion users is still 50 million and getting to 50 million users is a pretty big deal. Um, and so 
a lot of the tools we have in terms of thinking about standards, in terms of thinking about open source, are really not scaled to the size of the problem that we're dealing. And that's why I'm using too many words to describe this. You're using too many words to describe this because we're still basically putting together the pieces of how do, how the hell do we think about this massive thing um, that we need to govern if we want to keep it. Um, but, but we're still struggling to figure out, is it a tax if you do a thing without a government, but it's sort of like, sort of prodded by a government and helped, um, but it's, it's actually transnational so that everyone benefits. It, these, these are, these are sort of like mind, slightly mind bending, um, ideas, but they're also, I think, what the, what the situation calls for. But again, this is why we, we have to maybe, you know, look for ways of explaining, explaining them. That, that are better than what I, certainly I've come up with uh, so far, so that we can keep imagining this the, the, this future and, and and thinking of a world that that actually works. This talk that I w almost gave, um, a thing that I missed from it is like explaining. I, I think maybe I did this in a blog post, like explaining the world that the web was born into. Like it very nearly was born with you know web browser being like a shrink wrapped piece of software that you would just go and buy at the store because <laughs> there were actual stores back then that you would go and buy software at. And, you know, like, it's interesting to think about like all of the ways that companies exist and things exist to produce software and like, what is the, what is the funding model and all that? It is currently ads on search. And as you said, like a lot of the data, a lot of the value is extracted and, uh, only a tiny portion of that goes back into actual funding. So I, I think, you know, it's informed, educated, back of the napkin sort of uh, estimates, but I think $2 billion a year would cover like the entire ecosystem, not even just one browser. You know, when you look at it that way and you say, well, there's, but there's 5 billion users or 6 billion users or, you know, um, that's, that's not a lot of money like <laughs> that we that we really need. So, yeah, I don't know. I would like to see us explore lots of ways. Uh, I, mean, I think about this with television all the time, that that also is going through this terrible phase right now where like if you watch sports, like you have to pay to get all of the different streaming packages <laughs> because they are not just on a single channel anymore. And, uh, you know, it costs you a. $114 a month to watch football or something like that, you know, like it's, and that still has a million commercials, you know? Um, I don't know. It's a similar thing where there's like a lot, a lot of value being extracted out of that in multiple ways. It would be nice to think about the ways that we want, like what is the future that we want of the internet? Like, I don't, I think ads have a huge role to play. Like it's, it's a really good way to fund a lot of things, but I think that needs to also be somehow rewilded. <laughs> Like it's, uh, everything is pumped through kind of two specific channels and it's the only way to monetize right now, which is not great. I, I, I mean, I certainly can't disagree with that. I think, uh, however, uh, I mean, it's true that we could, we could imagine, like you, you mentioned television for, for the longest time in many countries, um, television was, you know, publicly funded. Uh, if you think of, uh, of a model like the BBC, there's basically, you know, a small, I forget what they call it. I think, I believe they have a very specific British name for it, but they, 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 there's a specific tax that goes to, to towards the BBC for everyone who owns um, a TV or it, perhaps even a, a radio set as well. Cause there, there's, there's also, um, there's also public, uh, public radio channels. Um, and uh, sure enough with, you know, 5 billion users, uh, you really don't need that big of a tax to pay for, 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 you know, to, to, to finance, uh, two billion dollars, which is you know a a, a the, the high end of the fork, I think, to support all browsers. That being said, I don't think that browsers are the entirety of what we need to support, and that is also why I think we need to be a bit more ambitious. Um, I, I, you know, if we think in terms of what makes up web infrastructure, there's a number of other things that that that, that come into play. Search is one. Uh, you know, should we be thinking of a, 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 a model that we need to be thinking actually of a model that finances search? Because as we've seen, whenever search it become, becomes under the control of a single, a single player, um, it, it, it gets into a terrible state. I mean, like 
people have been joking for 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 months about how bad Google search had become, and you know now now we have the AI version that's even worse, and pe people keep posting um, these hilarious things. But but uh, funny as they are, this is critical infrastructure that that is being um, that is being stripped mine uh, in, into uselessness uh, for for pure profit, and so. You know, one proposal I had made before uh, for the advertising ecosystem that, that that you mentioned is that instead of having um, advertise the, the rules for advertising be set by the people who run advertising infrastructure, it would be good to have uh, the rules for advertising set by the people who use uh, advertising, and that is publishers, advertisers, and people. Um, these are the three constituencies that you know. They all benefit in different ways from advertising, and yet it's hard to think of people benefiting from advertising. But were it done well, um, it could be done without violations of privacy and to grant access to quality content to the greatest number. These are valuable. These are valuable things. So I think yes, looking for two billion dollars a year for browsers is definitely part of the uh, 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 of the problem. But we should also be thinking about ways of governing every single one of these pieces of infrastructure so that they work for us. Um, and then, you know, you can have like a, an absolutely wild, um, competitive capitalist market landscape sitting on top of it. So long as the infrastructure itself is not controlled by, by individual players. And so long as it works in support of, you know, public interest. You know, I, I will say that I, uh, I had a little bit of a, of a, maybe a tremor when I read in, your article, what you're saying about rewilding, it uh, targets entire ecosystems to make space for complex food webs and the emergence of unexpected interspecies relations. It's less interested in saving specific endangered species. Individual species are just ecosystem components and focusing on components loses sight of the whole. Um, when you apply that sort of thing to social and human systems, that sounds like a lot of dystopias I've read over the years. So how would we avoid the dystopic outcomes here? <laughs> I mean that, that, that that's a good point. I think it's important to to understand that you know this is not something that you apply to individuals for instance. So what what this sentence is talking about is there have been rewilding um projects where the uh the species that 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 disappeared and caused you know uh, ecosystem upheaval was did, did not e either was completely lost it went completely extinct or did not reproduce well in captivity such that reintroduction was, was very perilous if possible at all. And so one example is, I forget exactly where, I think it was in Madagascar, where a giant turtle was performing um, an, an important ecosystem uh, function and it became um, became very, very highly endangered and it was it was extremely hard to reintroduce it. And instead, people worked on reintroducing a different, um, uh, a, a different uh, a giant turtle. Um, and apparently, this has been having, um, you know, a positive impact because it, even though it's a different species, it is having the same kind of effect on the environment. That is the kind of tinkering that people have historically been afraid of because it's the kind of sort of bioengineering. Um, that, that can really, um, backfire. Uh, but if you really think in terms of functions, uh, a function, it can work. Uh, similarly in, in Europe, the, there's, there's a, a project, I forget exactly what it's called, but that is uh, basically trying to breed, um, horses, um, back into their wild equivalent aurochs that, that, um, that, that disappeared. And, and, and that, that is, that has not led to reintroductions. Uh, oh, not horses, actually. Sorry, they're, they're uh, cows. Uh, it's called Project Tauros. And the idea is really bringing back uh, the, the wilderness to something that is functionally equivalent, even though we will never get um, the, the, the same species back. And so, uh, right. So I, I think when you, when you read that, um, you're thinking more about like, hey, People, people are, are in, in, interdependent or groups of people are, 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 you know, interchangeable and, and let's, let's get rid of them and, 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 and focus on the whole. That's really not, um, what we're saying here. What we're saying here is much more, Hey, perhaps specific companies or specific software projects or specific, um, 
protocols might be interchangeable, might be replaceable. It's okay if, if we lose some, so long as we maintain um, that, that, that overall structure. The important thing here is, is to not focus on nostalgia, right? So the idea is that, hey, you know, chat systems are you know, too scattered today. The idea is, hey, it's not, hey, let's bring back IRC, but much more, how can we make um, them um, interoperate, or at least how can we integrate them better uh, if uh, if interoperation isn't possible? I hope that clarifies it. Yeah, I mean, it clarifies that what you're talking about, the individual technologies or the individual protocols or the individual whatever, the individual technological components, not the actual people who are using the web. Yeah, people matter. Which is good, because unfortunately, right. I, I mean, I you know, unfortunately, and also by contrast, the system that we have now does not always value people. And I think, I think the system we have now rarely values people, I would say. Yeah, so today we have Google, Apple, and Mozilla, uh, definitely champions of the web, but single org stewards. Important thing isn't to maintain any one of those or for it to be a single steward. I think it could be, for example, really good to to improve that because there are like multiple sort of stakeholders who spend a lot of money to make products around things and participate in standards and but then, you know, they just ultimately they're all begging for those three to please pay attention and help with their thing. And maybe that thing is like SVG or MathML that gets just absolutely no love from those orgs. But there's an awful lot of people who care about that. In the recent state of HTML survey, it was SVG was very, very high on stuff that people cared about. and yet it doesn't really get a lot of attention. So so I think what you're saying is that like it's what is important here is to maintain the the qualities of this that we that we think are good that we think are important how they interplay like that there is some diversity but there's other things that maybe we would want to change like about how investment came into the platform and how we manage where it goes and how it's responsible to the different constituencies and is that like way off, or that's kind of right? No, I think I think I think that's 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 kind of right. I mean, you you, you mentioned SVG. I, I I remember, you know, for instance, one one uh, pretty intense debate that happened um, I, probably I don't know twelve fifteen years ago. That was about how SVG would work in HTML proper, like with the HTML parser. SVG was initially developed purely in an XML context, and it had a pretty well-defined, or at least decently well-defined, integration into XHTML. But it had no defined um, way of being integrated uh, into into HTML. And you know, at some point, people started saying, "You know what? These are just like pretty much tags, and." If you don't do the, the XML self closing thing, but like you close them as separate tags, um, separate closing tags, then it will, you know, just work in an HTML context. And, you know, maybe the parser could simply map them to the proper, um, SVG classes and voila, you have SVG in, in HTML. A lot of people started screaming against that. Uh, because they were like, that's not how SVG was defined. It was supposed to be XML. We really care about that, that very specific syntax. That's how everything works. You're going to lose namespaces. You're going to lose a whole bunch of other things. But really, you know, at the end of the day, what, what is it that you want? Do you want specifically one syntax for vector graphics or do you want, you know, an awesome vector graphics system that actually happens to work in the browser? And I think. Anyone reasonable would answer the latter. And so, yeah, maybe it causes friction when you have to switch syntax and switch technologies, but really focusing on the outcome and, and, and on the functional role of that specific technology is what, is what works there. And of course, that's a small example. Like most people will never be impacted in any useful way by uh, some, some, some pretty minor differences in syntax for vector graphics. But I think this is the kind of thinking that, that we can apply across the board. So I'm curious how uh, much hope 
or maybe hope's not the right word. Uh, do you feel when you look at, uh, for example, the Fediverse, Mastodon, and and that threads and all that sort of uh, work that's happening around? Um, I think we're still calling it microblogging. And can you submit your reply in the form of a blue sky skeet? <laughs> there you go. So I I think well first one of the important components of rewilding is is hope itself. The the you know a, a lot of working in in ecology is really hard. People talk a lot about about the damage of the 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 ongoing climate disaster. And that is absolutely true, but it's only one of the ecological disasters um, that are currently ongoing. There's also um, a massive collapse in, in biodiversity that is pretty much just as threatening as, 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 as the climate emergency. Um, and so when you work in rewilding, one of the core tenets is you have to approach the, the problems with hope because approaching them with doom and gloom is really not going to get you anywhere and it's not going to help you make change in the world. And I really think that is something that we need to bring back to, to the tech space. There's been a lot of uh, very justified work on criticizing tech, but it sort of has created this mentality of, of you know, um, powerlessness. Uh, we're here and, you know, we really can't do much to change things. Why bother imagining a world in which, in which things could be better? I think that's not the case. And I do have hope. And I think, yes, the Fediverse is one area in which, um, uh, that, that, that gives me hope, uh, because people are using it, uh, but also because people are reinventing, um, uh, new ways of doing things. Uh, I think other, other approaches to, to social, uh, social networking that are being uh, invented these days that are not necessarily based on activity pub and, and, and other Fediverse technologies are also very interesting. I think at Proto and Blue Sky uh, have some very interesting architectural approaches. I wish people were, uh, were less interested in picking sides and more interested in looking at, uh, at architectural choices. I've been, I've been paying pretty close attention to Nostra. Uh, recently, I haven't had a wonderful experience using the social network, but the, the technical decisions made, uh, in terms of the, of the architecture, not necessarily the, the details. The details are, are, are very much a mixed bag, but the, the architecture is itself very simple. I was able to implement uh, a useful Noster, um, server in under a day and it, it is leading to all kinds of very interesting experiments with people in not just using it for, for microblogging, but using it for, um, longer blogging, for file sharing, uh, for, for the people are creating a, a complete marketplace protocol on top of the NASA protocol. And basically this whole world of experimentation, I think, I think is very promising. It's not enough. Experimentation on its own is not going to displace the overbearing power of, of incumbents, but we sort of need both. We need, we need an approach that, that targets that, that excessive authority. And we need, we need an approach that creates new imagination, new, 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 new dreams, new thoughts about what the future could, the, the future could, could look like. And bringing those two together, I think can be really powerful. So just on the off chance. <laughs> that some of our listeners might not know what Nostra is. Give us a brief, like, what is that? Uh, sure. Uh, so Nostra is a decentralized social media protocol. It works in a very simple way. You post messages by uh, signing them. Your identity is, a, is, a, is, is, is you know, a, a private key and you sign messages and you post them to relays. And anyone can run a relay. You normally listen to multiple relays and it's decentralized in that it, it, it's very hard to censor because you'd have to censor all the relays to prevent one person from posting. And it's also easier to run than most peer-to-peer -peer systems because peer-to-peer -peer protocols tend to be difficult and painful to work with. And so this basically server-based, but using the fact that that servers are cheap and anyone can spin up a new one is, is really what, what, what's powering it. So yeah, you post signed messages to, to, to a bunch of relays, people, you listen to a bunch of different relays and you follow the people's public keys and you get updates. That's it. <laughs> Interesting. I do feel a little bit like as, as developers, maybe it, we can get a, a little bit more of a handle on, on all of this. 
was one of the things you talked about in the article was shifting baselines, right? And how if a baseline shifts over a long enough period of time, it's very difficult for humans to notice. <laughs> this is one of the problems we're having with climate, you know, the climate crisis, for example. And, uh, you know, things like uh, you know, insect diversity and, you know, those sorts of ecosystem problems. But um, I, f I do feel like as developers, you know, we're a little bit used to baseline shifting on scales that, that we can see, even if we don't immediately uh, react to them. So like, uh, and I use react there sort of as a pun because J J JavaScript frameworks are an example in our field, in the web field of how the, sort of the normal baseline changes and how shifting from an older situation or an, an older context to a newer context can be difficult. Right. It can be very hard to keep up and it can be very difficult to, you know, switch from jQuery to Moo tools or Moo tools to Angular or whatever. But it does it does seem like we've we've also had that on a on a longer time scale that people don't notice as much with the web itself, right? It started out wild and it became managed, <laughs> plantationed if if to use that uh, that term, and you know, a lot of people now, probably a lot of developers now, might think, well, of course, this is how the web is, um, and you know, those of us who've been around a really long time and are old uh, can remember a different time, but I wonder if if maybe it's possible to sort of make the argument to the people who develop this stuff and sort of present to them, hey, you know, the way that like JavaScript framework baselines have shifted. That has actually happened on this larger scale and it's possible to shift it again. Like it's it's possible to have a situation different than the one we have now. Um, am I on anything like the right track here or have I overlooked like critical differences between those two kinds no, of I, I, I completely agree with you. I think, well, apart from the fact that you, you re, you're really dating us when you when you talk about switching from jQuery to Moo tools, um, I, I like everything else that you, I like everything else that you said. Um, I, I think I, there's a, there's a form of defeatism in in a lot of people who use the, you know who, a lot of developers are just like oh well you know that's that's the tool that's popular this week and next week it'll be another one. And I'll just have to learn that and that'll be it. Um, without getting involved in, in the decisions that shape these, the, 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 these tools and these decisions matter. Um, and I think there's several things that, that people, you know, that as developers, we can pay more attention to that can really help shape our collective systems in ways that will have also good effects for, you know, people who are not developers. Um, one of them is to pay attention to the governance of things. Uh, a lot of the time, you know, we tend to like not want to deal with governance or, or not think too much about it, but really the, the defaults that we set in the systems we create have, um, you know, they matter a lot. There's this really good book from uh, Nathan Schneider called Governable Spaces, um, in which he, he points out the fact that every single a collective system you install starts off with, you know, one super admin with total power over everyone else. And then, you know, you can add some structure to give a bit of power, to delegate a bit of power to other people. But there's really this feudal system that's like completely built into it. Well, you know, we can think of other ways. We can think of like systems that are just like open by default. And then you have to install um, uh, a, a, you know, a political regime for it. Uh, they've done experiments with that in, in some games where it starts where everyone's an admin, which of course has security impl implications. You do want to install some kind of, uh, uh, of political regime pretty quickly. Um, but you don't have to have a super admin. You can have, you know, some kind of, um, voting system, liquid democracy, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think it's important to like think of those defaults. Um, another thing, you know, that people, I, I, that developers I find are often insufficiently curious about what's going is to understand what's going on under the hood. It's always instructive, you know, at least once when you're using um, a library 
to pop it open and go like, okay, when I call this, which is something that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a method that I, I, I call every day. What does it actually do? And there's several things that come out of that. A lot of time you realize that, um, some things that happen under the hood are way more complicated than you, than you anticipated, which you, you know, will help you understand other parts of the system or why there are constraints on what it can do. But also you might realize that it might be doing things that, that you'd not, you would rather it didn't or that don't feel necessary and that you could build an alternative. Think of alternatives. And so like really digging a little bit, um, into what's happening at, at the lower layers, um, can, can help. And a final thing that, that I think um, is worth reflecting upon, especially for people who are curious about open source and open standards and, and all that, is to really take the time to read up on, on good protocol design. There's a number of RFCs about that. Uh, there's people who blog about it, like Mo Nottingham regularly talks about things like that. Uh, Martin Thompson has written some, 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 some good things. And the reason I bring that up is because I'm noticing, you know, in this sort of effervescence of people creating new Fediverse systems, new, new, new social protocols, etc. that a lot of people have their heart in the right place. They are outstanding engineers in terms of implementation, but they really don't have the last, the, 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 the slightest idea of what it takes to create an interoperable protocol that actually works at scale. I see the same mistakes being repeated over and over again. And, you know, things that, that the ITF or the W2C figured out you know, 20, 30 years ago um, are, are being repeated. And again, like if, if we want to make the world better, if we want to make this, this tech stack work better, uh, let's, let's, let's learn from, you know, the people who shot themselves in, in both feet and, and, and the knee, um, you know, 15 years ago. It, 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 it will, it will really uh, sh shorten the, 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 the painful period. Yeah. Um, so paying attention to those things is, is good. You know, paying attention to governance, paying attention to protocol design. But let's say someone pays attention to governance and they, they want to do more. They want to like, push things help like help however they can to push things in the direction of better governance to rewild the internet like wh what are some things they can do i mean <laughs> inventing the future um it I, I would say it it really depends on what your focus is there's no point in trying to become good at something that you're not personally interested in it you you know you'll you'll hit a wall um, I think, I think it, it, of, of the entire universe of things that you feel need to be rewilded. And there's a choice, like, you know, search, social, um, you know, co-chairing, chat. Uh, there's, there's a whole universe, you know, advertising, if you want, browsers. Um, there's a whole universe of things that need to be rewilded. Like pick the area that bothers you the most or that you're the most interested in and really try to understand what kind of alternative is possible? And the alternative is, isn't, you know, is never going to be something superficial like, Oh, wouldn't it be nice if X is how do you change the dynamics of that system such that it works in, in, in and produces the outcomes that you think are beneficial? And a lot of the time, this is going to be, you know, it, it's not something that you can, that, that you can do, um, you know, in half an hour, um, while you're waiting for the bus. It's, 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 it's going to become a quest, uh, because once you start pulling on one thread, you're going to realize that you can't just change that system. You're going to need something else, but really, um, you know, following, following that interest in making one specific area better to what kind of proposals, what kind of structure would make the first great step for, you know, developers who are the kind of people who will be able to like dig into things and, and get their hands dirty and, and, and look for, for the next thing. So you talked a lot about the, the protocols and everything. And I just wanted to mention that like, uh, you know, you're working for protocol labs and on, you know, kind of like, um, distributed web kind of ideas and, uh -huh. um, like, Introducing that is like, I see it as a little bit similar to the like SVG thing that you were talking about earlier. Like, how do we like, how do we marry that into the web that we have today so that you get it to a broad audience and everything? Like, do you see a, 
any kind of correlation there or not really? I uh, no, I absolutely see a correlation there. I've been I've been working on that quite a quite a fair bit actually, um, uh, it, especially in, in recent months. It's certainly interesting to think of all these new ideas in the D-Web space, in the Web3 space, et cetera, um, as, as, uh, as having potential better pathways to, to blend into the web. I think a lot of the time, these new t- newer technologies were invented in ways that don't necessarily mesh well or integrate well into the web or work well with JavaScript or work in browsers or with HTTP. And in order to bring the best of their value out in order to really like deliver them to the greatest number of people, but also in ways that have the greatest impact. Um, it's really valuable to look for ways to integrate them better into exist, into existing web stacks. And so one of the things I've been working on quite a fair bit recently has been to poke at uh, IPFS, uh, the interplanetary file system and basically break components out in a way that I think could help them work better with the web. Um, so, you know, for instance, IPFS is content addressed, which means that you find content um, based on the hash of that of that content, which has all sorts of nice properties in terms of verifiability, um, knowing that the content you have is, is authentic, caching, uh, getting content from untrustworthy sources, but still knowing that you're getting the right thing. These are all nice properties. Um, but so they, they rely on, um, IPFS relies on content IDs um, that, that encode these hashes and content IDs are very flexible. They have many, many options, um, but that also makes them pretty unwieldy to manipulate and deploy. And so I'm working on a subset of CIDs called Lucids, lightweight universal CIDs, um, that uh, is very easy to manipulate with, with JavaScript, very easy to integrate into existing web systems and has practically no options. And I think by doing that repeatedly, uh, we can find increasingly better ways of integrating these new technologies into the web and bring the, bring the benefits there. Um, and so I, I, I really think that's, that's the most fruitful approach that, that we can take. I like that you took a page from Tim and put universal right in the name. <laughs> I mean, t- Tim, t- Tim went back and forth over that one, but he always regretted um, yielding on, on, on the, on the universal at some point. So, you know, yeah, right. let's keep it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that's really cool. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how that comes about. And I, I think we've had some discussions on this before as well. Like, um, you know, we have had other protocols like the tell protocol that, um, you know, you can put into your page and, um, it makes things a link, but actually turns out in a lot of cases that like the browser just sort of like smart, you know, educated guessing what things are phone numbers and then making them dialable is like a way more practical thing in a lot of cases it doesn't become a link unless it can become a link it doesn't become a link on your desktop that won't go anywhere might launch a skype or something which you don't even have an account for anymore you know um so yeah it's it's interesting to think about you know how you integrate these things and like what approaches we do uh and sort of like what things in the past we learned from. So I'm, I, I think there are a lot of really neat ideas there that I would like to see us have like a bunch more experiments with and uh, how we can bring those things to more users, because that's, um, you know, that's how we can find out if there's some there, there that can, you know, grab on and and get somewhere you know like it's I, I think a new protocol is a little bit like you know a new browser where it's like the power of defaults right like all all these things that are the default because they're so widely used you're trying to break into that space it's it's hard to get the inertia that you need to break out of the you know in, into the real mainstream of, of things so I, I don't know i i i really like the the space and the things that I see happening there. So I hope that it continues and I would like to find more ways to 
play more with that stuff myself. Do you have some ideas about like ways that if, you know, um, some people who are you know listening to this show that don't know a lot about IPFS or, um, you know, like how, how can they get their hands dirty and experience it a little bit and, you know, kind of a low friction way to get introduced to it and have something they can play around with? I mean, you know, it, it, again, it all depends on what use cases you're interested in personally, but like one, one easy way to jump into IPFS is to just head to IPFS.tech and follow one of the tutorials. Um, that will get you on your feet pretty, pretty quickly. Um, in terms of experimenting with ways of integrating IPFS into the web, there's, there's been work in Brave. There's a build of Chromium that includes uh, IPFS support that you can get. So those are all, all also interesting ways of, of tinkering with IPFS. And also, like, so as I mentioned, I've been working on this thing uh, called Lucid. It's really an exper experimental playground. So, you know, uh, caveat mTOR, don't, don't go digging into that unless you're, you're, you're willing to play with things that are probably broken. But really what I'm looking for is increased hackability. I think a lot of these D-Web systems lack a degree of, of hackability. And when you're trying to build something new, uh, it's important to make it more hackable uh, so that people can try really stupid things really quickly. Uh, and some of those stupid things might turn out to, to not be so stupid. And so with that in mind, uh, one of the things, one of the reasons um, that I've been looking at Noster, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is not because I'm enjoying the, the, the experience of the social media itself. It's, it's a bit too Bitcoin-y uh, for my tastes, um, but because it's an extremely hackable um, protocol. And therefore, I'm trying to figure out interesting ways of injecting pieces of web into social media. And so one thing I'm working on is, hey, if you have like a small bundle of web content and you manage to serve it in a way that has very strong security so that it can't, you know, phone back home so that it can't report on its usage so that it can't access arbitrary, um, APIs on your behalf, like really something that's really contained. You could create like little islands of interactivity that use almost the full power of the web, or at least the full power of the client side web. Um, and so by serving those. Uh, in a content addressed way, you can serve them in a more private way. You can serve them in a more reliable way. And, and yes, this, these are things that I, that I call tiles that I've also been developing as part of this Lucid project. And I'm currently trying to, um, to build a version of Nostra that supports tiles so that you can basically send people tiles that are full fledged HTML, um, the CSS, you name it, um, interactive, um, uh, systems, but that can be embedded safely in anything and don't have privacy downsides or just don't have the traditional privacy downsides of embeds um, and, and are very secure. So this might seem very abstract. I, I, if we, if we were in front of a browser and, and a code editor, I, I would, I would, I would show you. I'm, you know, of course, happy to, to, to discuss this further with, with people on the internet. Yeah. Well, we're speaking of that. <laughs> Where can people find you on the internet and they want to chat with you or uh, maybe yell at you or maybe <laughs> send you money? Or uh, all of the above uh, uh, is all welcome. Um, um, so my, my blog is at burgeon.com. Uh, my email is robin at burgeon.com. My Blue Sky account is robin.burton.com and my um, Fetty is robin at mastodon.social. You'll, you'll notice a theme there. Oh, and my GitHub is uh, da robin. So all of these are, are, are welcome. Yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out. Oh, also robin.77 on Signal, if, if, if that's your thing. Mm. Can you maybe spell Burgeon in case people? Yeah, B-E-R-J-O-N. Bejon. Uh, Maybe. Awesome. Awesome. So is there anything else that you wanted to say, Eric? I wanted to say thank you very much, Robin. That was a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, thanks to you two for having me. It's been a, a great pleasure. Thanks.